Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 829. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is November 7th, 2023. All right, welcome to our happy place. This is Anglican Unscripted. This is where Kevin and George sit down in front of our webcams, turn on the record button, and talk about what we find interesting in the news around the world. Generally speaking, we talk about a lot of Anglican stuff, but Christian, secular, war, peace, we talk about it all. Yeah, you know, it's just Anglican Unscripted. George, how are you doing this week? It's a busy time. I had one of my daughters visit. She bought a conversion van. and RVer. She, we have an RVer in the family. Good job. Well, she was spending over 3000 a month for rent in oh, San Francisco. And she decided she'd buy one of these little conversion vans, an RV. It's a Dodge. Uh, it's a Ram Promaster 1500 yep. with a bed and toilet and shower and everything, little kitchenette. And she's allowed to park for free in the parking lot of the hospital where she uh, works. And they have ladies' locker rooms and showers and gyms. And since it's a psych hospital, the parking lot has barbed wire fence around it and guards walking around so the crazies can't get out. And she says, look, Daddy, in, in one year's time, I can pay uh, you know, what I would pay in rent. Mm -hmm. Basically wipes out what I had to borrow to buy this van. So she bought it down here in Florida because everything's cheaper in Florida, visited us. And she stopped by the house. And of course, being a good father, I insisted that I put all new tires on, change the oils, the filters, this and that. And she's driving up back to California and she stops in Atlanta and says, Dad, there's all this stuff, all this stuff dripping onto the ground. What color? I, oh, I said, oh, my goodness. And she <laughs> videos it. And I said, Bunny, that's either transmission fluid or radiator fluid. And I was actually relieved because I didn't touch either one of those. If I'd left the cap off the engine or had done something stupid. So, Kevin, you, something that you once told me about RV life came true. She had to go get a new radiator. There's a pinprick hole in her radiator. And I said, just replace the whole thing. Don't, don't mess around with that. Because when you're driving across the deserts of Arizona and California, I oh, don't no, want your no, radiator to no. blow up. And, and, and it was a thousand dollars. Yes, sir. I mean, that's the joke amongst my RV friends here is no matter what it is, whether it's a broken uh, cabinet door hinge or uh, a radiator hose, it's $1,000. We say, that'll be 1000 And that's just, that's RVing. And boy, I can attest to that this year. Um, but, you know, it, it, RVing is the worst financial mistake you could ever make, but the memories, George. You can't beat the memories. But if anybody asks, you know, is there financial wisdom in, in full-time RVing? No, but the memories. The memories. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, if you haven't noticed yet, uh, you see the backyard. I'm back here at our palatial spot at the Florida Grand, uh, where all my friends who are RVers, my neighbors, are slowly coming back to the, uh, the Florida Grand and parking their RVs and getting set up for the long winter as it, it's starting here in November. Although it's going to be 85 all week, George. Yeah, yeah, it's still chilly in the mornings. It's uh, in the 50s in the mornings, which is uh, Arctic frigid conditions for me. <laughs> it is. So we will. this is the, uh, the the location of the Anglican TV studio until sometime in April when we leave. Uh, had a great trip this summer, and uh, glad we, we're back. And uh, I don't know if I've told you people this, but if you've ever read uh, Rod Drescher's book, The Benedictine Option, where uh, he calls the, the future of to save for the future of Christianity, you want to kind of meet in your own little communes and get together and worship together and fellowship together and don't let culture uh, influence your, your life and your Christian life. I'm putting that in, in, in real brief details here. That is kind of RV life. In RV in life, you are basically uh, traveling with people who have your same belief system. You're, uh, most of them are conservative. Most of them work their tail off to be able to have this lifestyle. And there's the, the kind of this Benedict, Benedictine option where you're fellowshipping together. And um, that's 
That's the modern part of the, the Rod Drescher book, so to speak. George, we've talked ourselves to death here. Let us uh, let me make sure I have the record button on before going any further. And let's talk about the news. Um, first big news in London this week, the GAFCON primates are meeting for the next three days. Uh, also on a parallel uh, unrelated movie, the Anglican Consultative Standing Committee is also meeting in London. Um, here, Tale of Two Communions, right here, right there. Yeah, and two different opposing unrelated worldviews, the GAFCON primates. GAFCON is focusing more on uh, uh, the mission of the church, while the Global South Fellowship of Anglican primates are fo focusing on the politics of the church. And the Anglican Consultative Council, of course, does all the things the ACC <laughs> does. One group basically sees the Anglican communion as rudderless and leaderless mm -hmm. and having to reinvent itself. New networks for education, new networks for clergy support, new networks for uh, relief and development. Well, the other says, sees no problems whatsoever. Everything's just fine. And if we just are united, no, yes, of course, the ACC says there are some people who are unhappy. But, you know, we can set up a study commission and in 10 years time they'll come back and we'll get a paper and we'll share the paper. And it's just the two worldviews are just so very incompatible, different. It's, it's emblematic of the break that we're in where one side doesn't recognize the marriage is over. Well, I think one side has just, for all intents and purposes, believes that the church is there to be a mini UN. Mm -hmm. We're there to promote goodness and health and uh, a gracious society. Where in GAFCON, they understand that their gospel message is transformative. We're here to offer an alternative to what you see out there. Mm -hmm. And that, that alternative is a transforming life through Jesus and his teachings. Mm -hmm. And to the ACC, that's completely foreign. They don't understand it. I don't know if they ever believed it because I think the ACC has always been full of Anglican politicians. Yeah, it's uh, it's a non-representative, non. Uh, it doesn't speak for the Anglican Communion in any meaningful way. Mm -hmm. Its members are either appointed. Uh, they're not elected in any normal sense. The uh, within the uh, institution itself, there's sort of an old boy pecking order that sort of buggins turn. Who next gets to be in charge is whoever has been doing the dirty work for the last ten years. Sort sort of place. It's it's non-representative. It's just a bureaucratic blob, an entity under the thumb of Lambeth Palace. And it reflects back to Lambeth Palace, whatever Lambeth Palace wants. And we're now in a world where such a uh, way of doing business is not possible. It yeah. can't continue. No. When the world is this broken, you need, and you need the evidence that there's salt and light out there. And that's provided right now through GAFCON. And we appreciate that. So let's move on and talk about Justin Welby's bad, bad week. Uh, we started off last week's uh, episode, and the title was uh, Nikki Gumbel to Sue Justin Welby. And just that title alone got us our probably our number one episode in viewership ever. Had 150 comments. We do suggest you go there and, and uh, put your comments as well, because we read them all. But in as such, this week isn't going to be any better, George. No. In fact, Justin Welby had a horrible Friday, last Friday. Justin Welby met with two groups around the living and love and faith process. In the morning, he met with conservatives, 25 conservatives. Uh, Lee Gaddis, who's the head of the Church Society, wrote a little update on this. Uh, Nikki Gumbel has also been talking with the Archbishop of Canterbury. And Gumbel has made it quite clear that if the bishops go ahead and allow same-sex blessings, there will be civil litigation. They don't trust the ecclesial courts because they're under the thumb of the Church of England, but there will be civil lit litigation. And they've already, and Alpha, Holy Trinity Brompton, has the money to fund and pay for the best lawyers that England has. And they've already got some King's Councils, KC's, putting together the case. 
So that basically, that hammer is going to drop, and that's in the background. So Welby met with these 25 conservatives, and the conservatives basically gave Justin Welby a roasting. And at one point, Justin Welby said, well, who wants me to resign? And Lee Gaddis raised his hand and essentially said that, you know, false teachers should no longer teach. They were not willing to compromise. They were not willing to go along and get along. The, the fudge that they did on women clergy 25 years ago, where, you know, you can sort of split the Anglo-Catholics from the evangelicals and give a little bit here and a little bit there and promise that if you're opposed to women's orders, you won't be penalized. That has all shown to be false. And now they have no, Welby has no wiggle room with the conservatives. In the afternoon, he met with a larger group of liberal activists, Colin Coward, a friend of this show, with whom we disagree on everything, but I really <laughs> like him as a person. He's a fun guy. Uh, Kevin, you sat in his lap in a taxi Opposite. Ride. Opposite. Okay. <laughs> For 25 <laughs> minutes, the yeah, smallest yeah. taxi we were ever in, in uh, Cairo, Egypt, going from the cathedral to someplace to eat. Uh, yeah. and, and you know what they serve at every restaurant in Cairo? Fish. What's the fish? Fish. Yeah. You want our fish today. I had it yesterday. I know. So. Well, uh, and Colin is a very bright man, and he's a very uh, astute observer. And he his report on that meeting is worth reading. We've reprinted it in full on Anglican Inc. Mm -hmm. And there were other meeting, other uh, reports that we linked to from people in that uh, meeting. And Welby came in very very dour, very po-faced. And he asked the uh, people to sort of speak to him. And Welby had with him eight staffers. And the people went around the room. Some of them, Welby didn't know who they were or who their organizations were. Others he knew, like Colin Coward, uh, because Colin has been, you know, leading that charge with sure. a changing attitude for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the other uh, one one person wrote in uh, Facebook comments who had, was there that she noticed that Welby staff were not taking notes; they weren't paying attention. In fact, one staffer spent the entire meeting with her cell phone out, basically playing on Facebook or writing emails. And this attitude of "we're here because we have a duty to listen to you, but we don't give a damn." was given off quite clearly. And the meeting closed and David Porter, who was sort of the organizer of the meeting, one of the uh, archbishops, had, had been his former chief of staff, said, okay, Justin, you have two minutes to sort of summarize, to give your view. And Justin said, well, if I can't speak longer than that, I'm not gonna speak. Justin Melby had a little hissy fit. And so he was given a little more time. He was told that, well, this room is scheduled for another meeting. I'm sure it was vitally important. And Welby basically said, look, you people don't understand that I am 100% with you. So according to the witnesses in that room, and it's been recorded many times on uh, social media, Justin Welby outed himself as a standard bearer, a flag waver for the full inclusion of gays and lesbians in the life of the church. And I would not say it's limited to blessing. I would say if you're doing full inclusion, he wants uh, same-sex marriage. Uh, it's, and he you know, said, right now we're talking little blessings. You know. And he said, look at the appointments I've made. Now, he didn't name them, but we have a gay dean of Canterbury. We have a dreadfully unqualified new chief of staff who's a, as a West Indian woman, who's a, I'm sorry, an African woman who's a real harridan. Um, we basically, he is bought in, to, he, he has sold his soul to the diversity, inclusion and equity crowd. And he's angry with the left that they don't appreciate this. Well, there's a little bit of pushback and well, we shut up one woman who had to leave the room because it caused her to burst in tears the way he treated her. And so it was just a horrid, horrid meeting. Now on one level, 
Welby is now out of, fully out of the closet. You know, when he started, he was an evangelical. Since he became Archbishop of Canterbury, he has now become an ex-evangelical. He has moved away from his uh, biblical foundations into uh, a different world. And this is one of the reasons why Nicky Gumbel has dropped him. And I think this probably emotionally being dropped by Nicky Gumbel, because that was the place that birthed Justin Welby, who brought, you know, took him as a lay person and put him through the ordination process and basically raised him up. That was his churchmanship. That's where he's from. And they've now said, you know, we're going to sue you because you've crossed the line. So Justin had a miserable day on Friday. But we now know that, uh, you know, if the Gafgun primates are smart, they'll read Anglican Inc., and they will see and see where they will read what Colin Coward said, mm -hmm. and they will share it with the primates on the fence, primates who really don't want to talk about the gay issue because of a Muslim oppression or starvation or whatever issues more lively. I mean, you know, the gay issue is not an issue in Melanesia. That's not something they lay up, stay awake at night about. But uh, now that Welby has said, "I'm all in." Um, I don't see how he can go come back from that. No, it, well, he's all in, but let's be honest, uh, the Senate is not going to be able to pass this. No, no. And so no. You've, you, you've gone all in, and you, you, you've pushed as hard as you can be. you made the appointments you could make. Um, you've done the indaba that you could do. But here, at the end of the day, for some reason, your Senate will not allow this to go forward. And if the Senate will... Yeah, go. Oh, sorry. Yeah. What? I was just saying, can we jump down to our, our last item? Yeah, let's do that. Tie all? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, you know, that's, that was just Friday, what we're talking about. <clears throat> In the rest of the week, hmm. we had 44 bishops of the Church of England sign an open letter uh, saying that they support gay blessings, which is unusual because the bishops had always been kept silent. Uh, new groups are coming out of the woodwork. There's a new group called Inclusive Evangelicals, which has some of those bishops who signed the one, some of the 44 who signed that, plus members of General Synod who are claimed to be evangelicals but back gay marriage. They had a position paper, which for their members only, which uh, somehow or another wound up in our hands, and we published it on Anglican Inc. And their position paper says we're going to follow the Episcopal Church's route on gay blessings. We're going to basically it's we're going to develop a ratchet every time we meet we're going to it's going to click tighter click tighter and it doesn't go the opposite direction and so we'll start small with blessings but one day we're going to get to marriage so you know the, the plans are out there however justin welby's treatment of the liberal activists has been so bad that they basically are done with him people like jano's jane ozan and Colin Coward and others, uh, Marcus uh, Bell, are saying, you know, we can't trust the bishops. They talked a big game. Now they're telling us that the soonest we'll have gay blessings is 2025, and then we'll have to wait for a new synod to adopt it because the current synod won't uh, adopt it. Uh, they're basically saying, the hell with it. Let's just push for gay marriage now. Let's not do any more half measures. Meanwhile, the conservatives are coming at them and saying, look, all this stuff that you're saying, that we're not changing doctrine, that is demonstrably untrue by having gay marriage. And uh, Martin Davey, for instance, wrote a position paper, as is Andrew Goddard, pointing out the logical and theological fallacies. But at the end of the day, what it comes down to is, if you're having a, if you're having a right of blessing and you're not changing doctrine, a right of blessing for a same-sex couple that doesn't change doctrine would also include a confession of sin and a statement of repentance because sex outside of marriage, according to the doctrine of the Church of England, is sinful. By omitting any sort of repentance or confession of sin in these new rites, you're no longer you're moving it from the sin category of human behavior to the blessed category of human behavior. And that is the definition of doctrine change. 
So Welby is getting hammered from the left, hammered from the right. Julian Mann had an article on Anglican Inc. where he basically said there could be a left-right alliance to scupper anything that comes out of General uh, Synod. And at the same time, the bishops are under fire because I, I forget which Archbishop of Canterbury it was, had promised that their delib the bishops' deliberations would not be secret. And what Welby has done has imposed total secrecy such that the press releases and the statements put out by Lambeth Palace and the Church of England Media Office sometimes bear no relationship to what actually took place in the House of Bishops meeting. When there's a very bitter and fierce division, might be 60-40 in favor of the liberals, out comes a press statement saying we're all united and we're all behind and we all sort of moving in the same direction. This is what prompted the 12 bishop conservative statement. This is what prompted the 44 bishop liberal statement. They don't trust Welby because he's not transparent anymore. And his, let's not, let's not, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say they don't trust Welby. They don't trust the system. This, yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we've hit this point where Welby can't deliver what he's promising. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I want to talk then about the Welby legacy. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've done all this work and you've taken it upon yourself to say, did God really say that? Uh, what is your legacy? Okay, you buried the queen. You uh, uh, got the new king uh, installed. Uh, you did Harry and Meghan's wedding. Is that your only legacy as the Archbishop of Canterbury? Uh, Archbishop of Canterbury? Basically, as a television personality for, uh, you know, English tourism. Uh, what I, I else? Don't is there? <laughs> I don't know. Well, I mean, you and I would tease him for the the Dilbert collar, but um, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that that's because sense, so. yeah, it, you and I are kind of petty that way. Um, hey, but that brings us to our next story. We have the closure of a clergy uh, um, accessory clothing uh, store, George. Yes, Almy's and. I don't know, Kevin, if you'll be as emotionally affected by this story as I. I don't know. I you had to tell me what always was. I went, what? Oh, okay. <laughs> Whipples, the English cloth English clothier to the clergy, vestment maker, mm -hmm. uh, is shutting down by year's end. And this past week, Almy announced they had sold all their assets to FC Ziegler, which is a Catholic clother. Uh, investment maker haberdasher now if you've ever been to an episcopal general convention there are two giant stands where you can buy any bit of church tat vestments stoles shirts all the stuff and that was either whipples or elmy they're not going to be both gone mm. and instead we're going to have a, a consolidation in this industry where the catholic uh, house is not basically going to be the only people in town um as a business person i think i can identify the problem and i'm looking at it george you are the problem and uh, and your kinfolk uh if you are selling clergy wear and your main customer is going to be new clergy because uh once a clergy person gets the comfortable uh, button-up collar they don't buy new ones george they get three or four and they live with them for 20 and 30 and 40 years. How long is he? What, just tell me your shirt. How old is that? It's about 30 years okay, old. Right. And see, this is the thing, Kevin. If a priest's clothing investment are jet, jet black, yeah, means he's right a newbie. Yeah. If mine, <laughs> this was once jet, jet black. And now what is this? Like grayish. Little gray. 30 yeah, years yeah. of washing shows that I'm an old hand. It's... Uh, um, an old salt, an old sweat. Yeah. You're right. I haven't bought, you know, my mother bought my vestments 30 years ago. And I really haven't bought, you know, spent a few thousand dollars 30 years ago on sure. cassocks and surpluses yeah. and stoles and yeah. shirts. And I really haven't had the need. You know, I bought half a dozen shirts, a dozen shirts 30 years ago and two styles so, that slip in and the full collar. And there you so, go. So in my defense of my business practices, if you can't rely on, you know, a whole customer base of 
uh, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of clergy, you can only rely on the, the new ordinance to buy from you. You're, it's not a good business model. You know, you have to, you have to put some type of practice where you have somebody buy a new shirt a year, a shirt a year club, you know, you could be <laughs> the collar a year club, but oh well. Uh, other news out there, we're going to talk a little bit about German bishops are going to go ahead with gay blessings, uh, not marriage, uh, no change of doctrine, but a pastoral measure. We do this because uh, we want to offer our clergy the ability to have a pastoral response to those who suffer with same-sex attraction, George. Karl-Heinz Weismann, uh, Bishop of Speer, which is on the border with France in southwestern Germany, uh, announced in a letter to his clergy on November 2nd, that in light of the German National Synod's decision asking the Vatican to permit gay blessings, he will go ahead and authorize it. And he wrote a thousand word letter, which we've published on Anglican Inc. I highlighted in English the pertinent parts, but if you read German, you can read his whole letter. And, Spe and uh, Weismann uh, said that uh, clergy may now bless same sex couples he, they may now have uh, divorced and remarried Catholics may now be blessed, have their relationships blessed. Those who had civil marriages may now have those relationships blessed. And in doing so, they're admitted to Holy Communion. Now, one of the jokes about the Episcopal Church is that half our new members are divorced Catholics who can't go to communion to the Catholic Church. Um, I, uh, Weissmann is uh, doing this by drawing on the work of Pope Francis and the German Synod. As I mentioned, the German Synod earlier this year, by an overwhelming majority, asked for this. And in Pope Francis's response to the dubia given to him by five conservative cardinals, um, where they five conservatives said straight yes or no on gay blessings. Francis didn't answer yes or no. He said, in appropriate pastoral circumstances, a blessing may be there. Now, what Francis did say is, but we need as a church to move together. So institutionally, let's wait until we're all on board. But as a moral pastoral issue, yes, gay blessings is permissible. That's how Bishop Weisman heard it. And so Bishop Weisman has gone ahead. And now that he's done it, I'm sure we're gonna see other German bishops go ahead because the German Bishops' Conference is not going to discipline. I mean, so far, it's, a, it's the Episcopal process. Mm -hmm. In Austria and in uh, Southern Germany, there have been cases of Catholic clergy blessing same-sex uh, relationships, and they were not disciplined. They were just said, you're a naughty boy. Now bishops are basically going outside of the synodical process, which is what happened in the Episcopal Church, saying, go ahead and do it. And until eventually the facts on the ground move the synod vote to a determination. Now, Bishop Weissman did said no priest is compelled to do this. And uh, how long that'll last, I don't know. And he said, we cannot, you're not allowed to use the marriage ceremony because this is not a sacrament. Catholics believe marriage service is a sacrament of one of seven, but rather you're doing a blessing. So you can't use the marriage ceremony, so we need to come up with a blessing ceremony. But again, like the Church of England, or the Church of, uh, the Church of England, and we have another story about another Anglican group that's uh, come out, uh, there's no repentance, no confession of sin. The gay sexual relationship has now been moved from a sin to a blessing category. But this is not a doctrine change, Bishop Weisman says. <laughs> Lex Orlende, Lex Cardende, yeah. Um, I know. It's crazy. So uh, we're going to talk about the two Irish dioceses adopt motions asking for blessings of same-sex marriage by synod. Um, it, it's kind of hard to pull off in Ireland because you get the northern, the conservative north and the liberal south. Bishop Archbishop Michael Jackson of Dublin, his diocese of Dublin and Glendalow, it's United Di 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 Diocese, at its October meeting of Synod uh, passed overwhelmingly. And the reports from participants was like 90-10 in favor of asking the Irish General Synod 
to permit same-sex blessings. The, then on the 24th, I think it was, the diocese of uh, the synod of the diocese of Tuam, Killal Limerick, and Killaloo, which is the western uh, edge of the Church of Ireland, adopted a resolution by secret ballot, which we're told passed overwhelmingly, asking for the General Synod to adopt gay marriage. Now, Michael Burroughs is the bishop of uh, Tuam, Killaloo, and uh, Limerick. Limerick, Killaloo, whatever. And he's long been a liberal. He's been in favor of abortion. He's, you know, he's had some stunts where uh, we need to apologize to our Catholic neighbors for the 39 articles because it's offensive to them. Catholics couldn't care less what the Anglican articles of religion say, okay? Huh. Burroughs is a bit of a, uh, I don't want to say clown, but he's a bit of a huh. uh, attention seeker. And so two, and probably a third diocese is going to do it, or they may have done so as well, uh, Cashel and Ossery. All three are located in Southern Ireland. Now, a little history. When Ireland had its civil war in the early, in the 1920s and split between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, the Church of Ireland Protestants in the West Coast, in particular of Ireland, were driven out. There was an ethnic cleansing of Protestants and by the IRA and other people. And so, for instance, Bishop Burroughs Diocese has 24 parishes. And of those 24 parishes, five of them are vacant, missing clergy. Now, a parish may have three or four or five churches, but they're 24 benefices, which is essentially the size of my deanery here in northwestern Florida. Well, where did these Irish Protestants go? They went north to Belfast, to Armagh, to Northern Ireland. And the Church of Ireland in Northern Ireland is approximately two-thirds of the total Church of Ireland population, maybe even more. And they are, by and large, conservative evangelicals. And to change game, to approve gay marriage requires a two-third vote of bishops, clergy, and lay people in their synod and no way, uh, no way that is ever going to happen, given the current makeup of the Church of Ireland. Okay, we'll see what happens. I would have said no way for the Roman Catholic Church. I would have said no way for the Church of England, but, you know, never say no way. Uh, let's move on to our next story. Story number five, Bishop Stuart Ruck case heads to trial. And this is, okay. I need to back up, let you know, I am biased here. I'm a fan of Bishop Stuart Ruck's work, his church, his ministries. Um, I just visited his brother's church in Minneapolis. Okay, I'm a fan. I'm also a fan of Bishop Accountability. So I, I, I have so many paradoxes going on here in my mind, George. That uh, was announced by uh, uh, email last night that you and I got and posted on the webpage that uh, they're going to go forward with the trial. They list what he sections he is supposed to have violated, but they do not tell us what he's going, what he's accused of, George. Yeah, he. There is a prima facie case that Bishop Ruck violated the canons, necessitating a trial. So he's not guilty. Yeah, no. but it, you know, and but we're not being told exactly what it is and when it was. In other words, we don't have the charge sheet. Um, and it wasn't put in this press release. Um, now, now, I've seen it in the back drawers of the internet going back and forth, people sent me petitions uh, against uh, the bishop. They sent me emails and stuff and other correspondence that we don't post uh, because, you know, let, let, let this develop a little further. And there's lots of spurious accusations that occur in these letters. But nothing to the point where I would see, you know, a person going to trial for them, George. Um, what I've heard, and again, that's that's the level of confidence I have in this. Yeah. What I've heard is that the Bishop Rock, in the view of his accusers, mishandled the Church of the Resurrection abuse case in Illinois, where a lay leader was a rapist. He was, he's been convicted of raping mm. parishioners. And Bishop Ruck did not handle this according to the letter of the ACNA canons. Now, 
in his defense, if this is the case, this would have been the first time anything like this had happened in the ACNA. It's a new thing. And Bishop Ruck may have tried. Here, I'm speculating. Yeah, we, Maybe yeah. he tried, you know, let's try to resolve this, pray, all this and that, and rather than bring in the lawyers and the police. I don't know. Yeah, we don't know. And I don't want to... Uh, and, and forgive us for speculation, Bishop. but we could have put a little bit more in the press release, is all I'm saying. Well, and we don't yeah. want to denigrate Bishop Rook, no. nor no. do we want to say his accuser is a crazy nut job. We just don't know. Yeah. Um, but that's why we have... Bishop, that's why we have accountability. We hope this is an open and transparent uh, case that uh, we as lay people and, and clergy get to see what's happening and uh, judge the transparency of it, of it all. Let's move on here to the Danish church says no to uh, euthanasia. Wait a minute. The, the, aren't the Danish socialist liberals, George? It's uh, a funny <laughs> world we live in, Kevin. Um and, you know, it's a funny Anglican unscripted week. Yeah, yeah. Two weeks ago, we had a story about the Estonian Lutherans. Last week, we had the Icelandic church. Now we've got the Danish church. We're in communion with them all, but uh, they, they're Lutherans with bishops. Well, Denmark, uh, the Scandinavian countries, uh, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, and Iceland, have always been sort of out there politically. They were the first with... Uh, gay blessings, transgender stuff, surgery. You know, they've been opened the doors to Muslim immigrants and all this stuff. In the past year or so, the Scandinavians have moved in the other direction. Uh, the five Scandinavian, the Nordic nations, they call them, yeah. are now going to deport Muslim immigrants uh, who are violent uh, send them back uh, to the places they've come and not close the door to just, if you can make it to our shores, you can stay and be on welfare. The the Nordic nations were the first to say, oh, we're not doing COVID masks. The science isn't there. The Nordic nations were the first to outlaw transgender surgery on children. And now the Church of Denmark uh, has said no to euthanasia. What happened is that a national petition was submitted to parliament uh, asking for euthanasia to be legalized. And the Church of, church of Denmark was asked its opinion because it's a state church. Therefore, it's sort of the ethics council. And there is an ethics council, but it was asked to offer its opinion. And the bishops of the Church of Denmark meeting in Viborg on uh, last two weeks ago uh, said that euthanasia is a slippery slope. You cannot draw a very fine, distinct line in law where it is permissible and not permissible. So in some circumstances, we see the sort of poster child of some person dying from terrible cancer pains. They have less than two weeks to live. It would be a mercy to give them morphine and let them out of their misery. But then we have what we're seeing in, in uh, Belgium and Holland and other places in Canada where people who are not dying, people who are mentally ill, people who have uh, who are burdens upon their family are being euthanized so that uh, other people are making decisions that the, that person's life is not worth living. Well, it, it becomes a slippery slope. Okay, once you offer euthanasia uh, to your populace for those who are suffering the most, wh who are we to determine who's suffering the most? Canada in December of last year, 2022, uh, changed the laws to say you don't have to have a physical ailment to seek um, euthanasia. You, you know, we're not going to require that. You don't have to be in constant pain. Uh, in fact, if you, if you so desire, you could be homeless and come to us and we could help you out. That's Canada. And, They're just north of us. That's sick. And the Anglican Church of Canada has gone along by and large with the government. Now, we reported, uh, I think two weeks ago about the diocese, the Arctic was furious about the national position because they have a suicide problem in the Arctic of young people with no hope, no future, alcohol problems. It's winter, six, 12 months of the year up there. Uh, basically, uh, the National Church of Canada is saying suicide is okay. Euthanasia is okay. Uh, the dean of, uh, the current bishop of the Toronto uh, before he was uh, Andrew, okay, I forget his last name, Bishop, An okay, the bishop, 
current Bishop of Toronto, before he was Bishop, was Dean of Toronto, and he took part in a euthanasia service where a couple who were parishioners surrounded by their family killed themselves because they were getting on. And they wanted to basically not go through the sufferings and ravages of death and decline and dementia and bodily failure and all this and that. And this priest took part in that and blessed them as they killed themselves. He's now he's dean of he's now he's bishop of Toronto. So we've got a case where the Canadians are way out there on, you know, maybe Justin Trudeau wasn't the cause, but sort of the emblem of Canadian kookiness these days. But the Danes, of all people, have said no. No to transgender surgery, no to COVID masks, no to Muslim immigration, no to euthanasia. These are the liberal Scandinavian socialists that uh, my daughter wants to emulate in the United <laughs> yeah, States. And mine too. <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, uh, it's crazy. So, but... It is for okay. Hold on, let's back up here. Lord Carey supports euthanasia. Former Archbishop of Canterbury. I'll confession, Kevin. I consider him a personal friend. Sure. So I have not read anything that he's written on this because I don't want to get mad. I don't. <laughs> but oh. I, I, we we need to be a full disclosure here. It's not just a liberal conservative issue. You know that uh, mm, carries the outlier. I would yeah, say. he would be an outlier, but uh, um, it, it just disappoints me that uh, things like this make it slippery slope is not a fallacy. There's just once you take these steps, there's no way to take it back. Uh, we saw this with um, the the U.S. Supreme Court ruling for same-sex marriage in 2015. Seven years later, we're having drag queens showing their genitals in public libraries to kindergartners. That you you can't take that back. How do you how do you take that back? Because you allowed one thing to be permissible, you allow everything to be permissible, and it's the same with euthanasia. Once you start down that road, who are you to determine, you you white privileged person, what suffering is? Yeah. You're right, Kevin. You're absolutely right. We, we've allowed a culture of hatred to take over this nation, the United States. The secular news is a, uh, has, is a buzz with the manifesto of this transgender girl who went in and shot up the Christian school. Mm -hmm. And her manifesto is she, you know, she wants to kill all these white crackers who are uh, benefiting from white privilege. Her manifesto is a manifesto of hatred based upon I hate to say this because I don't want to get sued, but allegedly based on TikToks sure. warping your mind. Yeah. Well, that's I need full disclosure. That was not her manifesto. That was just the pages they found. There's another manifesto of six, a manifesto of 16 pages they haven't released yet. That's just the the preliminary. And yeah, uh, a person was right. Uh, this person went to public school and she was raised to hate white america well okay guess what's going to happen and she's know, a white girl and she's a white girl uh she was raised to hate herself she became transgendered and fused um and uh you know it's, it's a mess but george she's not the only one you know i hang out a lot on uh, reddit at a d trans uh subreddit where all these kids who were convinced uh, over the last uh, 12, 15 years that they had gender confusion and that there's a, a specter of gender uh, were taking hormones or got surgery, and they go to this, this website to get help. Uh, and they're of the thousands. Currently, there's like 45,000 members of this site saying, I was tricked. I didn't have gender confusion. I was just a tomboy. And I got surgery and they cut up my arm and made uh, an artificial penis for me and i thought that would be the game changer i'd finally be a man and you know what i discovered i can't become a man i must be a woman and to my eternal shame the church of which i am a priest the Gen national convention at that last uh, convention affirmed uh the goodness of castrating little boys letting children make their own decision about their gender ideology 
I, I saw a video by Jordan Peterson who talked about this issue, and he, I think one of the statistics he related was that two thirds of the mothers of transgender people uh, are certifiably mentally ill. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, no question. And yeah. so much of the transgender movement is being uh, driven by social media and dysfunctional family structures with mental illness in the mother. Uh, yeah, I would say specifically the iPhone. In 2006 or 2009, when the iPhone came out, uh, there was one transgender clinic in all of America. Where now, a couple, of, you know, a decade later, after Instagram, after Facebook, after Snapchat, we now have 4,000 uh, gender clinics. We've now, you know, in the public school, it's just it's crazy what we're we're telling our children. And I hate to sound cynical, but there's a lot of money to be made in the transgender business by the big pharmaceutical companies with the hormones, the supplements, by the medical corporations that own the hospital chains to set up these clinics. Uh, people are making a fortune mutilating boys and girls. Mm -hmm. I can remember, Kevin, 10 years ago when we would talk about female genital mutilation and we would uh, roundly condemn people from Africa who yeah. would uh, who would uh, surgically circumcise uh, little girls because that was their tribal customs and how barbaric that was. And now we live in a country where my own church is in favor of female genital mutilation and male castration if a confused 12-year-old thinks it's uh, who God made them to be. North America has not been this unsafe for children since the Aztecs were in charge. You know, it, it, this it's ridiculous to what we're doing. And to oppose it is to be a hater. You know, common sense, reason, science, philosophy, uh, medicine. If, uh, if you are on the right side of all those, you are a hater. And, and I'm white. It makes it worse. Ah, George, let's go. We got one final story here. Oh, yeah, well, going back to Britain. Um, Armistice Day, November 11, 11, 11, 11. Uh, it celebrates the end of World War II. Um, you know, clearly uh, the end of Germany, uh, Nazism, what Nazism did to their children. Um, here we are looking at protests and street marches in Britain test limits. The next march is planned for Armistice Day, November 11th, and may disrupt national celebrities in London. This is a typical... Celebrations. Short. Celebrations. Celebrations. Oh, come on. I can't read that small font. Celebrations no. of London celebrities. Um, we have seen uh, unprecedented scenes of violence, of uh, hate, in Trafalgar Square, in London, in Birmingham, in Manchester, and other cities in England, where people are shouting, kill the Jews, uh, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Now, what does that mean? That means all Jews will be expelled or killed. Killed. It, 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 what it means is kill. Yes. It says kill the Jews, not, not displace yes. them. Yes. And... Uh, I saw something on the Babylon Bee, uh, which is a satirical, it's quite good, satirical uh, outlet in the United States where a congresswoman, uh, uh, Talib from Michigan, mm -hmm. um, who is a Palestinian at descent, a Muslim, you know, has been chanting from the river to the sea, you know, Palestine will be free. And then when confronted by this, uh, she said, oh, well, this is aspirational of, uh, you know, what we want of uh, wholeness and niceness. And the Babylon Bee's response was to put a swastika and say, you know, the swastika is a symbol of aspiration. Heil Hitler was an aspirational call for freedom. And the problem we have is that the government in the United States and in Britain, the police are totally supine in the face of these protests. We had the January 6th, and wherever you stand on whether there's an insurrection or a bona fide legal this or that, the other, permits were given to the January 6th protesters. I mean, it was lawful for what they did. It wasn't lawful to go inside the Capitol, but it was lawful for those outside protesting. 
the FBI is now arresting those who never went inside. They're arresting those who just watched and chanted. Well, they were previously arrested. Now they're now being convicted. Yes. And okay. now, and then we have Muslim protesters uh, trying to scale the gates of the White House, breaking, you know, defacing statues, causing damage. And only one person was arrested in this horrific protest, and that was for for basically uh, defacing a McDonald's. Well, as the New York Times said, this was a passionate protest, George, not an insurrection. It, it's different. I don't know how. You well, know. It, you know, and this follows from the summer of Black Lives Matter, where it was mostly peaceful, mm -hmm. and only a few buildings were burned down, and only a few people were killed. Well, we have this situation in the UK where the police... Hamas is an illegal organization, and you've got, and I read recently, where two police advisors, people on the, the people who helped the police draw up their extremism uh, policies were in the crowd ch chanting, chanting death to the Jews, and the police do nothing. Um, and where I'm going with this is that I think September 11th, uh, November 11th, if the cenotaph celebrations are disrupted. The moment of silence is disrupted. I think the sleeping giant of uh, British nationalism is going to arise and basically start saying, who the hell are these people? And say to the government, you've got to get rid of them. Send them all home. Are there any patriotic Brits left, though? I mean, There are. There are. I mean, if we, uh, we have some of them are our friends, uh, well, yeah, Calvin okay. Robinson, for instance. Sure, I, but uh, he's a priest and a broadcaster, mm -hmm. and that circle uh, had formerly been around GB News. GB News has now been neutered, mm -hmm. uh, but you know the BBC is like NBC. It's totally in the pocket of the left and is an outlet for uh, government propaganda. Yeah. I just don't. I, I I know some people probably get mad, but I don't know if if Britain could ever have a tipping point again. The last tipping point of Britain was Brexit. Uh, I don't think you know. I think they were completely neutered by COVID. They're surprised by how they're manipulated by the government. But what are they going to do about it? They're Brits. They're they're kind, and they just they they speak with uh, vetted insults. That's about it. It, here's the issue. In, in my mind, the current prime minister is an unelected prime minister. He was elected to his seat in parliament. Yes. But Boris Johnson, you know, he wasn't a Boris Johnson for all his faults, led the party in a general election and was the face of the party. Mm -hmm. uh, the current prime minister is very weak uh, on these issues. Um, but there is one thing. The King's Speech, which is where the government lays out its policies and programs, it does appear, uh, which should be given later uh, later today or tomorrow, well, one day, uh, is not going to have a call to outlaw conversion therapy. The uh, arguments of religious conservatives and the libertarians saying you cannot penalize free speech has convinced the government, apparently, not to follow the Jane Ozan people and say you cannot pray for conversion and all this and that. So maybe there is hope of some sort. I hope. I hope. You know, uh, but it's di it's difficult to watch because you and I uh, are consumers of news. Mm -hmm. uh, I spend an hour a day or so, uh, and I go to Daily Mail. I go to Powerline Blog. I go to New York Post. Some of the places that you know still offer both sides of the story. Uh, I'll do a little New York Times if I can handle it. Little Wall Street Journal, if I've, I've had a drink or two, and I consume news. I, I'm that type of person. It gives me anxiety, and maybe sometimes there's a news story I can only go like half a paragraph in and go, ooh, that's a lie. That, you know, or, or I go two paragraphs and I said, yeah, that's half the story. Sometimes I find it's, I found a story at NBC News last week that had both sides of the story. I was very impressed. Stop clock is right twice. Yeah, <laughs> like, how did they do this? This person's getting fired. But in as such, you and I consume news. There's anxiety in that, George. We're watching uh, a war uh, happen in the Middle East, which we knew one day may come. We're watching uh, kids under 35 succumbing to 
uh, the influence of TikTok and other social media where they don't have the ability to think anymore, to have critical thought and, and reason about uh, history. We're seeing it in so many things that institutions, the, the church is lost to critical, mm -hmm. the, the church, the universities you know, were the first to go, the media, the, the Metropolitan Police, the American Army at its top leadership. Um, they're all uh, totally, there's, there's going to be a day of reckoning and there's going to be a house cleaning. Otherwise, I think we, we will start, the Western civilization will start to fall and you'll have more people moving into your uh, RV park to, in uh, Webster, Florida to be free from the craziness in the world around us. All right, so let's talk quickly about what's happening over in Israel and the Gaza Strip. Uh, the IDF has invaded Gaza Strip, and uh, the latest reports is they divided the Strip into two. They're going to slowly uh, get all the refugees to go to the southern part, um, who are in uh, the bigger cities there that are bombed out, and just take all the guns from the terrorists that are there. You know, they're not going to have time to figure out who's a terrorist and who's not a terrorist, but they do pretty much know who, who are members of Hamas and who aren't. And this is going to be happening over the next few months. Why aren't you hearing a lot of news? Well, they completely shut down the cell service there. There's no electricity, no water, no food. Um, they're going to help a lot of people migrate from uh, these bombed out cities to places where there'll be encampments. And uh, we as Christians uh, need to uh, pray for the situation and help uh, provide peace where there's peace. But I... I implore Israel not to fall for the ceasefire uh, call that's going on out there. Uh, you need to, to end Hamas once and for all and show them this is, no, there's no future in terrorism, George. No future. Mm -hmm. one of the, I agree totally with you, Kevin. Uh, one of the things that I always find ironic is that you know we have all of these, we've seen all of this propaganda about dead children in Gaza and this and that. Well, the Saudis have killed... 20, 30,000 children in Yemen in their fight with the Yemenis. Yeah. 80,000 children have died and been killed in Syria. If, if, the, uh, if the indicator of barbarity is the number of dead Muslim children, the war in Gaza is way, way, way down the list. Go to Darfur, go to Sudan, go to Syria, go to Yemen, go to these places. Go to China, where the Uyghur Muslims are being moved into camps, and their treatment by the Chinese government is so horrendous compared to anything out there currently. And yet Israel's the one that is the 10% people in this world see as the big, great monster. It's, it's awful thing. It's awful. Um... You know, I never wanted to be an Anglican broadcaster or an Anglican influencer, and I find it very disheartening to be here. It's humbling that I am, but I, the last thing I want to do once or twice a week is to sit down and talk about war, George. You know, uh, however, my God is a transforming God. I've seen him do it in people, in churches, and in nations. And my full expectation is he will do it again. There's no reason for him to stop trying. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 829 of Anglican Unscripted.